share something with us so you can walk us through your creative process. I'm gonna share uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 84 with uh, Corey Smith. Oh, cool. All right, is it there? Yes, it is, wow. All right, so this is what I typically get. Uh, Marvel will contact me and let's say they give me a week to do this. Uh, they'll send it to me via their FTP. I'll download it. And uh, usually I'll ask, uh, does Corey have any notes? Or is there anything specific about the cover that I need to know beforehand? Or if it's interior pages, it would be the script. You know, reading the script, seeing the time of day, and type of mood, what's going on, anything uh, that, again, that I might need to know before approaching it. So it lessens the amount of corrections I might have to do later. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, the newest Photoshop. Uh, I just got a bunch of new hardware. This is a new laptop, a new Photoshop. Uh, nice. And so I'm learning how to use uh, all this new stuff. I even got Clip Studio to start learning that. Um, I won't be sharing it because I haven't completely learned everything in that yet. Uh, but uh, I've got uh, this new Photoshop up and running and I'm pretty happy with it. So quick, quick Photoshop question. So when you first entered the game, where was Photoshop at as far as the, the version? Oh, yikes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be really back in the day, back at McNabb Studios. And uh, I think it wasn't even till maybe the third year of Kubrick School, or even it might have been after I graduated that they even got any computers. Oh, wow. So it would have been a really old version of Photoshop uh, way before they started charging, you know, the monthly fee. Uh, in fact, I, I know several artists that still hang on to their old computers and old versions of Photoshop just so they're not charged that uh -huh. monthly fee. <laughs> right now on the screen, I've got it uh, in a PSD file already because I'm about to show you what I did uh, in the process of making this cover. Uh -huh. um, but when I first get it, it's just a TIFF. It's not a layered file. It's flat. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I should pause. Uh, it's been slightly different recently. The more artists that are working digitally, the more likely I might get something that does have layers in it. Um, uh, like I just got a cover I can't share with you guys uh, from Z Carlos. Um, and he's been doing his work digitally and it has some layers to it. There's something in the foreground that's completely on a separate layer than the stuff in the background, um, which I'm glad he did because that helps me um, more easily separate what that image is in the foreground from the background. Uh, sometimes it makes it easier, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I'll get a layered file from somebody that's done it digitally and I'll immediately flatten it. I'll just make it a TIFF like I usually get there's no need for this image to be in so many separate parts. So this particular artist gave you a flat tiff and you, and you, you created a, a Photoshop a session. Yep, yep. As soon as I get it, I turn it into a uh, Photoshop document, uh, CMYK, or sorry, RGB color with the CMYK preview turned on. Uh, if you don't know the differences between that, RGB is for uh, colors you see on a screen and CMYK is for colors and stuff you'll see in print. Dropping knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing I'll do is, after receiving something like this uh, is called flats. Um, sometimes when it's a cover like this, very simple, uh, two figures, you know, I can uh, flat this myself. Uh, I'll go in uh, and what you do is you want to separate all the main areas that you know are going to be a, a, a major different color. Uh, his suit is different because all the flesh tones are a specific color. So if I magic wand his flesh tones, I've got not only his Dr. Octopus's flesh tones, but I've got Spidey's down here. And I can work it all on all the flesh tones at once because those are the colors I'm working with. Um, and same with his, his, his arms. 
I don't separate them individually because they're all going to be that same color um, and so on. So once I have that part done, the flats, uh, I'll move on to the rendering. Uh, but if let's say I'm on a book, uh, something, especially something monthly, and I know the editors want this turned around fast, uh, I, I hire a flatter. Um, I go to just flats, it's either .net or .com. They've been doing my flats for years um, and they, they're great. Something like Civil War, I had heavy help with the flatting. <laughs> <laughs> but then I get it um, and I turn those flats down here. If you could see, I put it in my channel, mm -hmm. very down at the bottom. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's basically you, uh, when I receive the flats, they'll be uh, in color and uh, and the flatter or myself, we're not necessarily putting any actual colors down, anything that's gonna be used in the final product, just enough to separate the different areas. And uh, so I'll copy, see how it says green copy? It's because mm -hmm. I copy this, uh, the green uh, section of these channels down here. And I also keep a copy of the line work down here. So I always can go back to the original line work and reference it and make sure that I'm, you know, doing it justice and not uh, obscuring anything that the inker might have done, you know, that is beautiful. So I'll click on this, which is uh, the very bottom layer. It's the background layer. Uh, if I turn off the line work here, you can see all my rendering and I'll Oh, wow. I'm not sure how well. Tell me if you guys need me to zoom in on anything ever. Everything looks great. Okay. Yeah, it looks awesome, honestly. Uh, so I go in, and if something... Uh... I like, I typically, it's not all the time, So because it, again, it depends on the artist. Um, when artists is like this, like Steve McNiven, and it's open, there's no grays or anything like that. Um, I'll, uh, again, it depends on the image, but most of the time I find myself working dark to light. So like in this case, if I were working on uh, Doc Doc's face, uh, I started with his flats looking like this. That's the base I had laid down. Oh, wow. And so with typical, uh, dark to light procedure with like acrylics and whatnot. You're, you're starting with the shadows and then so next I would go to my mid-tones and that's just clicking over here in the colors and I typically will go to the B which is brightness and you know it has this little slider here and you can see you can slide it all all the way up to the most rich portion of it if you want but you'll see you'll get a little warning this little triangle that's because it's warning you like, hey, this is an RGB color. It's not going to look so great in CMYK. Uh, 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 so sometimes you'll want to lower it so that uh, that either disappears or sometimes you don't, don't have to worry about it. Um, as long as you have the CMYK preview on and you're mindful uh, of it, you can uh, adjust it afterwards. So I'll go in with that mid-tone. And you want to pay attention to where the light source is. Pay attention to what the inker's done. Uh, that, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing other colorists totally blow through what the inker's done. And same with the inker. I've had plenty of inkers approach me and say, hey, you got a little too dark on this, or, or maybe it wasn't my fault, maybe it printed dark, or sometimes it was my fault. I, I used the too dark of a color. Um, so uh, one of the tricks I used for that uh, back to that little slider, if you can see it. Uh, on the brightness scale, I typically, if the color goes past this H here uh, for hue, that's typically where I think the danger zone is. You're, if you go past that H into the those darker blacks, you're gonna be obscuring the inks and uh, some of those fine lines and stuff that the inker spent so much time doing are suddenly obliterated. So try not to do that. <laughs> <laughs>
but back back to the mid zone. I start with my shadows. I pay attention to what the inkers uh, suggested. In this case, this is obviously lit from above. You know, the, he's, he's got uh, underneath his chin there. There's the shading underneath his chin. You can see very clearly in the reflection of his glasses, there's a bright light source reflected. You know, it's coming from above there. So when you're doing your midtones here, you wanna just go in. And I use just, I, I don't really use any specialized brushes. Uh, well, not too many, I should say. I like falling back on the basic brushes. Uh, so if you're looking at a one I'm using, this is just the brush that comes with Photoshop, Airbrush Soft uh, 100. And I set it so that it's sensitive to uh, my Cintiq pen. So but like right now, this is, I'm just lightly hitting the places that I think would need that color. But if I like the very tip of the nose, I'll push harder and I'll get more of that saturated, more pure mm. highlight. It's already looking super cool. Right? So anyway, let's see if I can go all the way back to where it was before I filled that. So eventually, I'll have this. Um, wow. And in this case, uh, I didn't really go to the third step. I didn't go to that third highlight uh, because the rest of the image, you know, this is sort of a darker image. So I kept the highlights uh, to the metal in his glasses. Um, those are things you constantly sort of have to think about uh, and, and apply to your work. Do you reference like metal or other uh, types of material when you are coloring? Great question. Uh, Joe Kubert, uh, god of comic books, uh, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> one of his main mottos was reference, reference, reference. Know what you're drawing. Know what you're trying to represent. Know what you're trying to bring across to the reader. You know, you, and for me, I'm not someone that can sort of pull that stuff out of my head. Uh, there are some artists that certainly can, you know, they've got that photographic memory or whatever going on. Uh, but I, I rely heavily on reference. I'll, I'll go into Google, Google Images. I'll pull up uh, other Doc Ock images. That, or in this case, you know, I had to look up uh, old comics when Doc Ock had that costume, you know, to make sure that I was uh, as respectful to that, uh, that style that was done back then as I could be while still bringing it to uh, sort of a modern look. Um, and then I, I pull up stuff like, uh, you know, metal in a dark room. You know, what, what does metal look like in a really dark room? What is it reflecting and whatnot? And, and apply that. And sometimes, you know, again, this, this comes down to the deadline. If I had this due in the morning, maybe I don't have the chance to look up all that reference. And I do just have to sort of fall back on my knowledge. And luckily, I've done a lot of these things before. I've done enough Spider-Man where I can sort of do it off the top of my head now. But if I have a week to do this, I'll do things like I'll pull up uh, the Spider-Man movie, watch it while I'm working on this, you know? So I get that sort of feel, the aesthetic. Um, I'll play the video game, you know? I'll oh, pause nice. <laughs> and make screenshots of the video game. Uh, especially when it comes to like the city, uh, I'll I'll go into that Spider-Man game and I'll pause and and freeze frame some of that to really see what you know the Empire State Building looks like at night with Spider-Man. The color choices is there like a generic like Spider-Man color uh, like CMYK code or RGB code like how does that work when you start dealing with the actual colors of the characters? Yeah, is there a Spider-Man red? <laughs> um, there, there could be. I, I don't want to say there isn't. Uh, this, that question falls back to uh, your process. Um, Justin Ponsner, uh, rest in peace. Yes. Uh, beautiful, 
fantastic, one of the most amazing colorists. He was on top of my list of people I wanted to be. Uh, he relied heavily on swatches and he, you know, he probably had a Spider-Man setup for swatch colors uh, and would use that to, you know, not only help him get it done uh, quicker, but be consistent. Um, for me personally, I don't do that. I don't save a bunch of swatches. I like eye eyeballing it. And because uh, I really feel it depends on the artist. Um, like here with Corey Smith, uh, I'll do with like the skin, a little bit more of a realistic skin. But if I got something from like, say, uh, uh, Chris Eliopoulos, where it's super cartoony, I'm not going to do that. It, it's going to be a flat color it's, and, and it would have to be very specific to his style and work for that image. Uh, I, now, I create a separate layer, which is a color layer, which I'll click on now. And you'll see I, I'll use black to desaturate uh, the five o'clock shadow just underneath his nose and uh, if I click just, you could see here. Oh, there it is. Do that. Oh, cool. Yeah. See that your ears, uh, I learned this from various people, but I think it really st stuck uh, st stuck with me after I talked to uh, Brian Selfries once at a convention that uh, you're going to get these red tones anywhere the bone is closer to your flesh. So, you, you know, you it's going to be around your cheekbones, it's going to be your ears, uh, it's going to be your elbows, you know, even, pull, you know, uh, the, the, your knuckles are going to have little differentiation of red. Uh, and even sometimes if you're working on a character like Wolverine, you know, you want to make sure you hit those veins with a little bit of uh, the blue, uh, you know, because when you're looking at skin, you that's what you see. You're but right. again, it depends on the artist you're working with. You know, you, you don't want to do that with somebody who's definitely trying to achieve that more cartoony style. Uh, so that's my color layer. And I typically only use my color layer for the red tones and the desaturation of the beard uh, because sometimes I do too much. <laughs> right? And the editor, you know, be like, hey, Maury, I see what you did there, but can you tone it down? And if it's on a separate layer, it makes it so much easier in the correction phase. Because then you're just working with the slider and you're not having to go in and redo something. And that's the reasoning for every layer after this. The whole reason for having a separate layer is just for ease of use later for doing corrections. More, you mentioned earlier that a page takes like six to eight hours. Is, is this how long this page would have taken you? Cover. cover. Uh, or cover, I'm sorry. Yeah, this cover probably did, uh, I don't recall. It was a couple weeks back. But yeah, it, this one probably took me six to eight hours. If I click the line work back on, you'll mm -hmm. see all that navy color disappears. Because that's, that's underneath the inks. Uh, but if I zoom down here to where it breaks in, Here's where I was talking about where you, you're you in the danger zone. Uh, the inker, which I think Corey inked himself in this case, um, has gone in and done this beautiful hatching here. Uh, I mean, it's just gorgeous. Uh, and so I've, that blue, that navy blue is just dark enough where it, the, it'll flow with those shadows and work with the image, but not destroy that line work. Uh, and as it gets further down, when they get down here closer to the dust, I start to get rid of that blue and move into some desaturated, obscured colors to represent uh, that dust floating up and being all around Spidey in this case. So how do you know when you're done? Like, I know you say you do six, eight hours, but I'm sure you're like, I could add there. I could like, how do you just say creatively, I'm done? <laughs> when there's a deadline, you just got to do your best to trust your instincts and uh, trust uh, 
you know, what you've been taught has come across. The, you've gone through all the steps, you've done your shadows, you've done your mid-tones, you've done your highlights. Um, you're, uh, you're paying attention to where your whites are because whites uh, usually will attract the reader's eye um, or warm colors will typically attract the reader's eye. So you wanna make sure you're, uh, you're placing that uh, in the right spots, you know, the faces you wanna pay attention to or whatever the main action in the panel or, you know, what what's the, the script say? You know, does it need to be focused on uh, what Spider-Man is doing or is it just really trying to represent how cool Spider-Man is in the moment? How do you how do you get to work with the people that you work with? Re, you know, these days. Uh, well, like I said, I I've been really fortunate. I've uh, I've I've gotten editors like Nick Lowe and Tom Brevoort who have really um, enjoyed working with me over the years and still think of me to this day as a go-to person. And uh, uh, so, like the other day. I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd be able to work on a Travis Cheris piece. Woo! Uh, oh. But amazingly enough, they were doing a book the other day and uh, it came to the point where they needed a colorist to hop in and help out. And it, it was under Nick Lowe and Nick Lowe thought of me, thankfully. And uh, there I was working on uh, Travis Cheris doing a, a Spider-Man cover. Wow. 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 That's awesome. So that, that hasn't been released yet, right? It I, actually, I think it has. Again, if you could give me one second. Oh, there it is. Oh, whoa. That's oh, fire. Oh, shoot. Yeah, that is. That's fire right there. <laughs> that's cool. So, so Maury. Uh, if you can't see Earth Mightiest Heroes, the Avengers annual number one. So that just cool. recently came out. So this, this is unusual. This next layer is a, a multiply layer. Um, I did this to sort of make it darker. And the reason I made it uh, an extra layer again is so if they came back to me and said, hey, Maury, this isn't working. It's not printing right. It's too dark. Uh, I could easily remove it. So so that's why this is here. If you, you see it alone by itself, it's oh, just yeah. some, some pale navy blue cast over the whole image. And as you can sort of see anything in the foreground, I sort of undid it so that that knee stuck out just a little bit more than everything else. There's the line work layer, which I typically don't touch. Uh, that's again, another thing I do personally. I don't like to obscure the artwork in any way until I get permission to. If the artist or Steve or somebody comes back to me and says, okay, this needs a highlight, that needs to break what's been done in the inks, then I'll do it. Then there's typical things. The next layer is uh, what I think you called the special effects layer earlier. Right, right. <laughs> uh, this is where, I, if you can see my labels over here, I'll, I don't always label them, but in this case I did. Um, I labeled it KOs, knockouts. Okay. And specifically for this image, it was just down here. This is where I knock out the smoke and where I'll add uh, my signature. Uh, uh, that's cool. If you can see that. Yeah. Yes. And then after that, um, I'll go in and do what I consider specific blows. Um, in this case, it's uh, Doc Ock's glasses, his arms, and Spidey's uh, uh, eyes there. Wow, Corey, I have so many. I have so many books that I need you to sign in the future, sir. I, I'm just sitting here thinking about I, that signature with the mo and the exclamation point. Looks so cool. I can't wait to get them on some books, man. Being well, honest, I'll, I'll be happy to do it. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so in this case, uh, it's a very cool image. It's in the shadows. So I, again, I stuck to the blue reflections. If Spider-Man was swinging in the city and it was a sunset. I'd be using warmer colors on his eyes because they're reflecting what's around him. So then after that, I've got the light layer. Um, this is where I'll have an overall sort of tinting. Uh, ah. If I turn it just on itself, you see I'm sort of drawing the eye down to Spider-Man because this is where all the main light source is going to hit. It's 
sort of refract off him. And so I've got this sort of overall warm glow to help lead the eye down to Spider-Man suffering in the dirt. <laughs> and then lastly, I've got these layers that I've been playing with recently. These layers, I don't know, again, I don't always use, but in this case I did. Um, this is a color balance layer. Uh, if you go into the properties of this uh, layer, you'll see I go to my highlight. I'll strengthen the highlights with uh, some warmth. I'll add, and again, it'll be different in the piece. For this one, I decided I wanted the, the warm colors the, for Spider-Man just to pop a little bit more, bring them a little bit more to the foreground. And, and, and it's just by like, you know, in this case, five pixels. You know, I, I added five red and five yellow to sort of bring that warm color to it. And then I go into the shadows and I strengthen the shadows the same way overall too. I go into the shadows and add some cyan and some blue to help push it, you know, push those those cooler colors back. Um, you know, it's, all, it's always pushing, pulling, because you got to pay attention to, you know, your steps, your foreground, middle ground, background. And then lastly, uh, this is something my buddy uh, Kevin Moyer turned me on to. He's one of the Comic Geek Speak guys. Uh, but I met him back in the Civil War days, but he was telling me about uh, the photo filter. Ah. And uh, if you look here, I've got it set to deep blue. And again, it just, it's, it's barely noticeable even. But if I like zoom in, you can see on his reds, Mm -hmm. I've got it set to a 15 deep blue for the entire image. And if I click it on and off, you can see... Oh, yeah, just a tad. It makes it a little different. That's crazy. It just sinks Spider-Man into that background enough where it's all cohesive. It's all one image, but it doesn't obscure it where it ruins where I wanted to pop him up into the foreground. Maury, I have a question for you. Uh, so I know you couldn't choose your favorite overall story you've worked on, but do you have a cover out there that every time you see it, you're like, damn, I'm happy to be involved in that or any books that just kind of the cover at least just stand out to you? Um, uh, again, uh, that that working with Travis Cherist was uh, a mind explosion. Uh, Anytime I get Quesada's mine explosion, uh, uh, Bradshaw, uh, I've had the privilege of doing some of his work and it awesome. blows me away, uh, which also reminds me of Art Adams, which I've had the privilege of working with. Um, all, wow. all these people really just, I'm, I'm so thankful and uh, blessed. Uh, to be working with all these people and that they like my stuff well enough to to, have, to collaborate. Um, but let me pick one for you. Uh, I told you earlier, Batman's probably my favorite character. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I finally was able to do a DC cover, uh, it was Jerome Opina. It was a Superman Batman cover, Brave and the Bold. I finally got to do a published Batman piece with my signature, and that's probably the one of, that's on top, you know, my list of all-time favorite covers. And, and you can see on my website, uh, MauriHollowell.com, it's one of the covers I put on the front page. Ooh, that's wow. awesome. You there and Jerome Pena. Oh, that's, that's yeah. a cool combo. Yeah, I've, I've done a couple pieces with him, and that guy, oh. Oh, incredible art. His X Force stuff is awesome, yeah. and that's and that's where I say it's different working with uh, different artists. Uh, with Jerome, he's got those grades. He's he's doing a lot of that rendering himself. Uh, so sometimes going in, uh, you're only tinting it. You know, you you just you want to preserve what he did because it's so spot on and perfect. Uh, you you want to make sure you represent it accurately in the color version. Um, same with uh, someone like Simone Bianchi, which I did a Wolverine run with. He does a, the heavy lifting in the rendering part. And it's a lot, it's about tinting it and preserving what he's done. And perhaps in whatever he does leave open, uh, matching it uh, well enough to keep everything uh, cohesive. Is this the final 
image right here we're, we're looking at here? Yes, yes. This would be, uh, when I'm done, this is, I save this as the work file, as you can probably see in the upper left corner. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just go to image mode, CMYK, and you flatten it. And now you can see on the right, there's only one layer now. Mm -hmm. oh, and then yeah. I go down to my channels and you throw away these extras because you want to be able to save it as a TIFF. Now I'll save this as a TIFF and that's what I send to Marvel. That's what they get. And then they'll, you know, that go through the editorial process. They'll tell me, you know, if I did anything wrong or need to adjust things. I'll do adjust, retip it, and send it back, and then letter gets it and it's uh, produced. Boom. Uh, if I could ramble on about one last thing. Sure. Uh, it would be another reason why I love Batman so much. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Batman, to me, not only did I, I fall in love with uh, those Norm Brayfogle books, but it slowly introduced me to other artists, and uh, like Joe Posada and uh, Kelly Jones. Uh, you know, I, I can go on and on. Batman black and white books, I think, uh, prove my point the most. Batman is an artist's playground. And it, you know, it can be done in so many different ways. And you, you could argue till you're blue in the face that someone's doing it wrong, but you're just probably in love with that specific artist and what that, that artist does. To me, I don't care who gets Batman. I love to see what they're gonna do with it. Man, Maury, I, I love that. What a wonderful endorsement for comic books, and that's what this show's about, and that's what Stash Bros. about, it's about getting people reading comic books, getting people loving comic books, getting people knowing about how comic books are made, and you just gave us a master class of, of comic book coloring, so we love it, and we are so happy that we got a chance for the second time in Stash Bros. history to get original Marvel artwork on the screen. So this is great. I'm, I'm so happy. Thank you for joining us, man. We're so happy. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for coming. Well, that's all for our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe and hit that like button. We are the Stats Bros. I'm Mike, speaking for Chris and Maury Hollowell. We are out. Peace!